Hi everyone, um, my name is Minda. I'm originally from Finland, but I'm currently living in the UK in London. Um, the study that I'll be talking about in this presentation was done at King's College London as part of my master's research project. And my presentation will be about modeling hallucinations using nitrous oxide. And I'll touch on the implications and potential of nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide or laughing gas as it's commonly called is a safe dissociative anesthetic used in various medical contexts. Um, if you live in the US, you might associate nitrous oxide with the dentist, but in other countries such as the UK it is often given when someone is giving birth. We actually found that nitrous oxide had similar effects to classic psychedelics, um, such as ego dissolution, which is the temporary sensation of losing your sense of self or identity and can occur during intense experiences such as meditation, psychedelic trips, or when you're deeply absorbed. We also found that um, participants reported more hallucinations uh, while they were inhaling nitrous oxide. And we, so we had auditory hallucinations and then we had someone who was a swimmer who had a visual hallucination. So while they were inhaling the gas, they thought that they were underwater in a swimming pool. And when we removed the gas mask, they actually took a deep breath as if they were coming to the surface of water. And interestingly, there's also preliminary evidence of the therapeutic potential of nitrous oxide for depression. And so why am I talking about nitrous oxide at a psychedelic conference? As we all know, psychedelic research currently faces significant barriers due to the status of the substances. Um, nitrous oxide offers a more easily accessible alternative as it has similar effects to classic psychedelics and it is also very safe if used appropriately. Um, but one way that nitrous oxide differs from other psychoactive substances is that it has very rapid onset and offset of effects. Um, due to something called low blood solubility. So when you start in, inhaling nitrous oxide, the effects come on in one to two minutes. And when you stop inhaling, the effects stop within, within two to three minutes. And this means that the exper experimenters maintain precise control over the effects and the timing of the experiment. And participants also recover very fast after inhalation, which is great for repeated measures designs where um, participants need to do both condition, both the active and the placebo condition. Um, and this is also great for um, when there's limited resources for research, as it means that experiments can be done um, quite quickly. So why did we decide to use nitrous oxide to study hallucinations? Um, as I mentioned, uh, this study was done as part of my master's degree. And apart from the reasons I mentioned in the previous slide, we used nitrous oxide for our study because we wanted to investigate auditory hallucinations. And a case study by Paulus et al. actually found that the most commonly reported psychiatric symptoms following nitrous oxide abuse were um, hallucinations, as well as delusions and paranoia. This sparked um, an interest into the psychotomimetic effects of nitrous oxide. So psychotomimetic comes from Greek, um, from the word psyche, which means the mind, which is also um, what the word psychosis derives from, and mimetic, which means to mimic. Um, and essentially, psychotomimetic effects mean uh, that the effects of the drug are similar to uh, symptoms of psychosis. And Piazza et al. found that nitrous oxide had psychotomimetic effects at 50% dose, which is the dose that we decided to use. So, some, so when talking about hallucinations, it is important to consider the neurotransmitter systems um, involved. And interestingly, some symptoms of schizophrenia, such as hallucinations, might be due to something called NMDA receptor hypofunction. Uh, NMDA receptors are receptors of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. And when these receptors hypofunction, it means that they may not be working as well as they normally would. And now you might think, well, how does that relate to nitrous oxide? Nitrous oxide is actually an NMDA receptor antagonist, which means that it blocks the function of these receptors. 
So essentially, you can create an MDA receptor hypofunction by using nitrous oxide. And just to drive this point a bit further, I'll show you some illustrations of NMDA receptors. So here we have the NMDA receptor, which sits on the cell membrane on a brain cell. And we have the neurotransmitter glutamate, which in a normally functioning NMDA receptor would bind to the receptor here, um, to the receptor binding site. And when you introduce nitrous oxide into the equation, um, due to its NMDA receptor antagonism, it also binds to the same site as glutamate here. And therefore, when glutamate tries to bind to the receptor, it can't because nitrous oxide is already there. So this causes NMDA receptor hyperfunction. And so I know what I've talked about is very biological, but I will tie this into the cognitive side as well. And that's where the predictive processing theory of perception comes in. So this theory um, suggests that the brain makes predictions of the world um, based on prior experiences, which are our priors. And these prior experiences are then compared with the actual sensory information that we receive. So what we see and hear an overall sense about the world. And these are then compared to create perception. And I'll illustrate this with a little example. So I'm sure we've all had this experience where we walk into a dark room or wake up in the middle of the night and suddenly a pile of clothes um, on a chair looks like a person uh, because it's dark and you can't see properly. So this is actually predictive processing at work. And this essentially your brain is relying on prior experiences. So you might have seen someone sitting on a chair at some point and you know what the shape of that looks like. So your brain is making a prediction of, um, of that. Um, and based on the shape of the pile of clothes on the chair that is similar to the shape of a person. And due to the limited sensory information, because you're in the dark and you can't see properly, um, your brain is relying more on the priors in that moment. And this actually ties into hallucinations as well. So hallucinations may be a result of abnormalities in predictive processing. And NMDA receptors are also involved in this. So NMDA receptors may actually be responsible for the predictive signaling where priors determine the influence of the sensory input. And one study found that individuals with hallucinations relied relatively more on perceptual priors than incoming sensory input. So in the example that I mentioned, a person with hallucinations might actually see a person sitting on the chair because their brain is more predisposed to relying on the priors. So the prior experiences that they had um, compared to the actual sensory input. And in, in the dark, when there's limited sensory input, they may actually see a person because they're relying on the priors. And so to tie this all together, in our study, we have NMDA receptor hypofunction, which is caused by nitrous oxide. And then we have the predictive processing model um, where priors and sensory input are compared to create perception. And our study aimed to bridge the gap between these two theories. So the way we use the predictive processing theory is by employing a conditioned hallucination task. So some of you may have heard of conditioning in psychology classes, but conditioning essentially means that associations are formed between a stimulus and a response. So in our task, the visual stimulus that the participants saw was a checkerboard and the auditory stimulus was a tone. So the tone was played and the checkerboard were shown repeatedly um, at the same time to create a conditioned association between the two stimuli. And during the task, there were also times when no tone was played. And a conditioned response would then be a participant reporting the tone um, due to them 
seeing the checkerboard and then associating that with hearing the tone despite there no tone being played. Um, and in this task, the priors would be the conditioned association between the checkerboard and the tone. And in this task, the tones were played at different volumes and sometimes not at all, as I mentioned. And we were focused on no tone trials and we're looking to see if participants reported hearing the tone more when it wasn't played while they were inhaling nitrous oxide compared to the placebo, which was medical air. So now I'll show you an actual trial um, of what the task looked like. Um, but bear in mind that there was white noise playing uh, throughout the whole task in the actual experiment. However, that, that's not present here. So it is actually in the actual task, it's actually uh, a bit more difficult to detect the tone because of the white noise. So the participants would first see the checkerboard and then hear the tone. They would then see this screen for a split second before being asked to indicate if they heard the tone or not. And in a no tone trial, they would only see the checkerboard, but no tone would be played. And then see this split, split this for a split second again, and then be asked to indicate if they heard the tone or not. And white noise would be playing throughout this whole thing. So what we actually did in the study is we had 40 participants in total of which we had females and males and these age ranges. And we gave all of the participants 50% nitrous oxide and the placebo, which was medical air. And all participants had both gases. Then a computational model was used to estimate the weighting of perceptual priors and sensory input. And what we found was that participants reported hearing the tone more when it was not played so on the no tone trials while inhaling nitrous oxide compared to placebo. So you can see this here, this y axis here is the probability of yes responses. And down here we have the condition, placebo and nitrous oxide. And you can see that the probability of yes responses is significantly higher in the nitrous oxide condition compared to the placebo. And what this means is that participants actually had more auditory hallucinations while inhaling nitrous oxide compared to the medical air. So this ties into the NMDA receptor hyperfunction theory of hallucinations. So providing more evidence that um, NMDA receptors are associated in auditory hallucinations. We also found that the, there was significant overweighting of priors relative to sensory information while inhaling nitrous oxide compared to placebo. And what this means is that participants were relying on the priors more than the actual sensory input. So the priors here again were the conditioned association between the checkerboard and the tone and the sensory information would be the actual tone. And this was also estimated by the computational model. And we also found that participants experienced, oh, you can see here, mean weighting of priors on the y-axis um, and the condition down here, placebo and nitrous oxide. You can see it's significantly higher here. And we also found more ego dissolution. Um, the participants were experiencing more ego dissolution while inhaling nitrous oxide compared to the placebo. So ego dissolution, again, is the temporary sensation of uh, losing your sense of self or identity and has been found to often occur uh, when people take classic psychedelics. So this, again, points to the similarities between nitrous oxide and classic psychedelics. So to conclude, we used nitrous oxide in our study because it's an NMDA receptor antagonist and causes NMDA receptor hyperfunction. We found that participants reported more auditory hallucinations while inhaling nitrous oxide compared to placebo. And we also found that nitrous oxide had similar effects to classic psychedelics, such as ego dissolution, as well as advantages over classic psychedelics due to the fact that it's easy to access and has a fast onset and offset of effects. And these all make it an attractive alternative to classic psychedelics. And now I'll briefly talk about the future of real world implications of our results. So our results provide preliminary evidence that nitrous oxide is a viable model for hallucinations, as well as for the role of NMDA receptors in auditory hallucinations. 
And nitrous oxide can also provide further insights into hallucinatory mechanisms, which would be great for if you want to create new treatments for persistent auditory hallucinations. So NMDA, NMDA receptors may actually be a great new treatment target for these hallucinations. And performance in the task alone could be used to predict transition to psychosis. So what this would look like is participants who are, or patients who are at clinical high risk of psychosis could um, complete the task and then their performance could be um, estimated based on the computational model. And those who are found to rely more on their priors might actually be at a higher risk of transitioning into psychosis than those who are not. And this could be used to then allocate resources uh, to these individuals to make sure that they are um, treated before they actually transition into acute psychosis. And here are my acknowledgements. I wanted to say a massive thank you to my master's project supervisor and the PI of the study, Dr. Devin Terhune, uh, as well as to Jacob Barnett for being my research partner um, during the master's project and to Dr. Matt Butler for his medical expertise and all the help with the project. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions in the QA session.